Okay, I am just going to put a little pin comment here. So that anybody who joins knows what's going on. But in a few moments, I'm going to get Liam Pitchford on here. I'm trying to look for a British flag. Where's the English flag? Okay, let's not. Okay, so um, I did a poll recently. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Um, I did a poll recently asking about possibly doing some player interviews, and there was overwhelming support for that. So I've decided to do some lives, and I'm starting off by doing a live stream with Liam Pitchford. Um, from England so he's currently ranked 15th in the world and he's a very interesting character and most of you probably don't have much idea of what a character he is so hopefully while I press him through some very difficult questions um, we can find out a little bit more about him but while I'm waiting for him to send a request to join What's my current equipment? Uh, I'm kind of in limbo at the moment. So I'm trying out the Daenerys from Eula, the Daenerys AGR um, and the ACC, um, but I'm still using Riser 50. All right, here we go. Liam Pitchford, the troublemaker. I have my laptop here. I've formulated some difficult questions, hopefully difficult. We'll give him a bit of a challenge. I'm doing great. I hope you guys are doing okay. Um, it's been a difficult time for a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of you are missing table tennis. I've been really lucky recently um, that I've been able to start playing a little bit in the club with Lily Ip. So, um, yeah, hopefully I can do more of that. Waiting for Liam Pitchford. Come on, son, join. Let's go. I've accepted him. Oh, he says it's not working. Oh, he's going to have to try again. Dan Pitchford, come on. There we go. I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say, it would be a bit of a flop if it didn't even work. Okay, you hey, How are you doing? Not bad. I like the new haircut. It's looking pretty sharp. Okay. It's not... It's not quite as far down as mine, but it's, it's close. <laughs> All right. I've got 10 relatively, hopefully, questions that will kind of pick at your brain. Okay. Um, it's nice of you to come out of the gulag to join me. <laughs> uh, that's why you spend half of your time. I do. I do. Honestly, the last game was terrible. That's probably the worst, the worst group of... Uh, Card games I played. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we're starting off somewhere near the beginning of the um, professional career. So you moved to Germany. You left England and moved to Germany in 2011. So you would have been 16 at the time. Uh, 17. Yeah. 16, 17. Um, so you started off playing in Ochsenhausen in the first division. Um, which is a big step up moving from England to... I know you played Danish League before that. Um, yeah. So the first question... Say again? I played a year in second league in Germany as well. All right, before but I, you were still living in England at the time, right? Yeah, yeah, most of the time. Okay. Um, so leaving your home and actually moving full-time to Germany, as much as that would have been an eye-opening experience and probably something that you really wanted at the time, um, it's still quite a lot of pressure, no doubt, to deal with. So how did you kind of, how, how did you manage the pressure of being quite young and leaving your family and moving to Germany? Because I feel like it's a, it's a topic that, isn't really covered that much and a lot of players go through the difficulty of leaving their home and leaving their families and moving to Europe to train full time and uh, for some of them it doesn't necessarily go the way that they wanted it to or they find the pressure really difficult to deal with so um, how did you initially 
at that young age deal with the pressure of, you know, being away from everything to pursue table tennis? Um, it, yeah, I mean, it was tough, of course. Um, I think for any young player leaving their country and going to a new country, obviously new culture, different types of food, stuff like that. Um, Sauerkraut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lovely stuff. Um, yeah, and, you know, obviously harder training. Um, and yeah, it was tough. You know, even though I went there knowing that you know, it was something that I wanted to do, I wanted to give it a shot. Um, see how far I could go. Uh, you know, the first two years, especially when I went into the first team, were, were really tough. Obviously, I wasn't playing as much. Um, obviously, being the number four player in the team behind three, you know, world class players. Um, yeah, we, it was it was hard. Um, I kind of knew I wasn't going to play done it very easy. And um, um, yeah, it was. You know, I just had to try and try pick in there. You know, keep working hard in practice and sort of believe in myself that it would it would come eventually. And you know, sort of after two years, I, I sort of became, you know, the you know a, a mainstay of the of the team, and I was I was playing really well. And um, yeah, it became it became a lot easier. Was Oxenhausen a difficult place to live? Because I know it's, it's small, right? It's only eight thousand. How does actually, well, I mean, how does that compare to where you grew up in England? Because I know there are a lot of small towns in England. Was that difficult for you to go to somewhere small like Oxenhausen? Yeah, of course. I mean, England, not, a small not from a massive place, but still like 130,000 um, people. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a really small, small town, Oxenhausen. I don't know if you've ever been, but um, no, for, me, for me, when I was... Um, for me, when I first went there, you know, it was I was young and you know, it you know, it, it's table tennis and that's about it. You go into the hall and you know, there's right. a few restaurants, but um, you know, it was it, it was good. You know, I think for young players, it's, it's a really good place to you know get your head down and work hard. Yeah, I would find like even if you look at China and different places in Europe, they always put table tennis centers in quite boring places. <laughs> so then when you go there, you can only focus on table tennis and nothing yeah. else. Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> okay. Um, one thing that kind of strands off from that is that when you were in Germany, you did have a lot of big breakthroughs for yourself and your table tennis career, but at the same time, um, eventually it did take quite a toll on your mental health. Um, so I know now you're, you are advocating for mental health services and uh, trying to get people to talk more. And I just wanted your thoughts a little bit more on whether you think that table tennis is lacking in that area and whether you think that clubs and the ITTF do enough to support um, players, because you, like I said, you really don't hear about players struggling um, with their full time careers. Or you were kind of one of the first players that broke out and said, and publicly said, "Yeah, I was struggling, and I had to, you know, I had to get some help for it." Yeah, I think you know, in most sports, I think a lot of when you get to to high level performance, you know, and pressure and stuff like that, a lot of athletes it's hard to deal with and. You know, at one time or another, probably most athletes have gone through, you know, a tough period. And, um, and yeah, I kind of wanted to, you know, it took a lot of, you know, it was one that easy for me to come out and make the, you know, make, make it public and right. like, I was a bit nervous. Um, but, you know, I thought, you know, at the end of the day, if I could go out there in my story and help, you know, even one person or a couple of people make that step as well, then, um, you know, make me feel um, better as a person as well and um, helps me take another step forward in my my life and my career. Which it did, right? I mean, you've kind of championed it now. You, you seem to be in a pretty good place. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, I've always said it, is, you know, it was one of the hardest parts of my, my career so far, but it also made me the player that I am now. I think it's it helped me become a stronger person, uh, not just on the table, off the table as well. Um, and yeah, I go out there now with a, a lot less fear than I, than I did before. Which is, yeah, then you started beating all the Chinese. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask a little bit more about um, is 
the, uh, you playing with the English team and obviously 2016 in Malaysia was a pretty big year for you guys. You made the semi-final of the world team champs. Um, what has it been like for you? I know you've, you've pretty much grown up playing with Paul and Sam um, as part of your team and also Bagley before, but um, now it, it seems more as if you, Paul and Sam have become the face of, of the British team. And so I wanted to ask, not for my sake, because I have a pretty good idea, but more for the people watching, um, what it's like traveling as a team with Paul and with Sam um, and how, how things have been like since you guys had that breakthrough in, uh, in Malaysia. Yeah, and I've always said I, I love love playing team events, um, especially you know with I've known Paul for a long, long time. Sam sort of joined the team in around twenty fourteen, um, so he, you know a couple of years before we we won the medal, um, he got into the senior team. Um, so since then, it's yeah, it's pretty been pretty much been you know there's been a few few players, um, you know number fours and fives that have. That have added to the team as well, but you know, since then it's pretty much been in me, Paul, and, and Sam. And um, yeah, every time you know we go go to tournaments now, um, just believing that we you know we can beat anybody, and um, you know it's probably not not been as consistent as we'd liked, but you know it's been up and down, and we've not always performed together at the same time. One of us has played well, and the others haven't, and stuff like that. But um, but I can always say you know I've had a had a great time playing with the together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got, and you guys do stuff outside of table tennis as well because I know when I got <laughs> when I got Call of Duty World War 2, you guys were playing that and then there was the uh, the boomerang that the ITTF took where you guys were doing the Fortnite celebrations. So you guys are kind of a team inside and outside the sport. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is great. I mean, yeah, I used to live with my teammates when I was in New Zealand. So. Yeah, I think it adds to the you know your team spirit, team cohesion. You know, if you're comfortable with each other outside of court, then it's obviously a lot easier to to trust yeah. each other to go on court and stuff. And um, yeah, most of it involves um, PlayStation. You know, Paul Paul was more into that when he was a bit younger. He used to be on the Call of Duty. Uh, now he's a dad. Yeah, I was going to say he's been absent. He's, like, he's not on the PlayStation hype anymore. But you know, we're. It, I heard that. Um, is it true that when you you were living in Halmstead during the the World Champs, right, in two thousand and eighteen? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I heard that you took the PlayStation from your house to the hotel. Is that true? That, that might be true. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Helps, helps me relax. Helps me relax, John. Yeah, it is relaxing. Yeah. Maybe not. Business. Yeah, yeah, which is important. Okay, um, so going along the line of uh, carrying on with the British team, um, you guys won bronze at the World Team Cup in London. And that was 2018. That was in front of your home crowd. Uh, how does it feel? I, I mean, England, I know England because I was born there, but England is a really patriotic, fan-driven, crazy place. <laughs> so comparing the World Team Cup to maybe other sports that English people get into where they get a bit rowdy, did you feel that there was something kind of special about the the audience then when you were playing in, on on home turf. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, to, to play at the Copper Box, you know, it's a massive arena and uh, one that they use at the Olympics. And you know, there's quite you know, a lot of people in there. I don't know the exact, but you know, uh, just there to to watch watch table tennis and. And be able to see us win a medal was was something. Yeah. We did a lap around, and everybody was on their feet. It was it was a bit of a surreal experience, and you know that that's probably the one event. You know, in front of the home crowd, you always want to to play yeah. well, win medals, and um, yeah, it was that was a, a very special event. Did and did you guys real? Did you guys expect that you'd be able to bring a medal? Because I mean, even though you won bronze at the World Teams two years before. It's still a pretty big ask to be able to repeat the performance, even though it's not the World Team Championships. But you know, it's 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 a pretty big, you know, a big yeah. goal to medal again. Yeah, and um, 
I think, you know, we went in believing we could win a medal. Um, and I think, you know, we thought, you know, if we avoid China in the quarter final, then obviously everything's possible. Um, and we were lucky enough to do that. Brazil beat, um, I think, they beat Hong Kong in the group, or so we, we ended up playing them, and uh, obviously still one of the best teams in the world, but gave a slight, slightly easier draw than um, you know one of the other teams, and we took our chance, and and yeah, that's that's all you can do. You can only beat whoever is in front of you. Hmm. Wisdom, good. Um, okay, so. I want to talk a little bit about leagues because you've played in quite a few of them. Um, so you played two seasons in the Danish league? Uh, one. One? 2010? Nine? I think it was nine. <laughs> you tell me. Um, so you played long Danish ago. league. <laughs> Danish league, German league, French league. Yeah. Ultimate, you did one. Did you? You did one season in India, right? With Ultimate, yeah, two, two. Um, and now T League now in Japan. Yeah, no Japan. Yeah. Um, so first, I wanted to ask you about Ultimate Table Tennis because it's a little bit different from perhaps the other leagues that you've played, and I just wanted to ask. Um, what really stood out about it? I know they've been really creative and there are some different rules. Yeah. Um, were there some things that you found a little bit strange or um, did you find the whole... I mean, you, you talked pretty positively about the experience and about how they looked after you when you were there. Um, yeah. So it sounded really good. Yeah, so, um, you know, going out there, I knew there was going to, you know, obviously they're trialing out these new changes, um, one point at 10 all and stuff like that. That and um, thought you know it's pretty interesting, um, but actually it turned out to, to be really good. You know, really exciting. The crowd, the atmosphere was was honestly amazing. Um, you know, now table tennis in India is obviously growing and growing, and um, the crowd seems to, to love it. And um, I think it's grown even bigger year on year. And um, I think they're doing a good, great job. Yeah, they're talking about season four at the moment. I think they. They might have secured backing for season four to guarantee having season four, but it always looks really good. And they're they're kind of going for that uh, I, that world championships of ping pong, like really focusing it on yeah. one table and making yeah. it more entertaining. But I know somebody said that I can't remember which player it was, but they said that when they were there, it was the most kind of team atmosphere, or they really felt like everyone was behind them when they were playing for the team. Yeah, so I mean, you have it, obviously there's a lot more, I think it's about eight players in the team the first year, so obviously a lot more players on the bench, which added to the atmosphere as well, and um, it was like one big family, each team was just like a, but like, you know, there was rivalry, but, you know, it was friendly rivalry, you get on with everyone, and it was just a, a nice atmosphere everywhere, you know, outside the hall and inside the hall. Was there like, were there any particular players when you played there? that you didn't really know that well before where you were put into a team with them and you uh, no I mean you know a few of the Indian younger Indian players but you know you get to know everybody you know everybody eats together and practices mm. together and stuff like that so it was um, yeah it was, it was you get to know each other quick and it was it was really good yeah it sounds pretty good I'd love to get out there at one point if they're watching, they can invite me. Not to play, oh, obviously. No, I did spend the night in hospital, so... Yeah. Really? Yeah. Is that a story that you want to delve into, or should we just uh, leave that one? Yeah, we might just leave that one. I had a bit of, uh, <laughs> yeah, some, I ate some dodgy food, I think. and uh, That does happen. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on to another league. You're playing Japanese league now. Um... Is that something you're going to carry on with? Uh, something that you'd like to carry on with? Um, yeah, so. Also, I mean, most of us didn't get much exposure to it. So I know particularly in the US or in the West, you don't really see um, live streams so much of the matches or so much coverage. So it's kind of hard to gauge what it's actually like. Um, so you're the in-house expert now and you're going to tell us. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I've actually I've signed another year, so I'll be playing again 
next season. Um, same team, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I think because it's on live TV in Japan, something that they, they can't live stream on the internet or something. I don't know the, the exact rights, but um, yeah, I hope that they can somehow get around that and try and broadcast more to to Europe and the rest of the world. Because um, I think it's you know people want to see it. it um, yeah. It, uh, like you said about the Indian League and the, the, the ping pong, they focus. You know, every match is just one on one table, uh, one match literally per day um, or a day. And um, yeah, the whole focus is on that match. You know, live TV, and it's just more of a. You know, when you get down to finals day at, uh, at a world tour, it's kind of like that. So um, yeah, for me, it, it was. So like it felt like you know you've got more pressure on each match. So, you know it's like you're playing a final every match you go on. It's like you're playing a final, and um, that was something that I wanted to test myself on. And um, yeah, I think it is a great initiative. Did you have? I mean, did you have any reservations about choosing to play a league? I mean, you're you're very comfortable playing in Europe now, obviously. Um, what was your thought process when? I'm assuming when they approached you to play in Japan, I mean, because obviously you have to spend a lot of time there. Um, yeah. Did you have any reservations about it? Yeah, of course, obviously I was a bit, you know, unsure about the travel, um, you know, because obviously there's a lot of tournament world tours going on as well at the same time. And then, hmm. you know, I was a bit worried, you know, traveling to Japan and then to Europe to play a tournament and how I'd be affected by that, you know. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's a crazy time. Um, but then, you know, on the other hand, I saw, all, you know, a play in the league, every match, every match you go on is a, you know, it's a tough match. It's a, you know, I'd say top 100 level in the world to every match. And, you know, that's what that's what you want um, out of a league. You want to play the best players every time. Um, and, yeah, that, that was kind of the... You know, spending time out there as well, watching them, how they practice, practicing together with, with Japanese players it was something that, you know, I wanted to, in the lead up to the Olympics, I wanted to, you know, go and try out and, and see, how I, see how I liked it. I've got a kind of difficult question for you now. Um, so <laughs> this is the hardest one, I promise. So you, you're back in the UK now and you've built a house. And so you're going to be basically based in the UK, right? So you're going to be training in the UK yeah. and then I guess traveling for T league once the season starts. Yeah. Um, so I found it kind of interesting because I mean, right now you're, you're kind of, I don't want to say at your peak cause we don't know how you're going to go like after now, but, you're at, you're in a pretty good place. Like you're ranked fifteenth in the world. You were twelfth last August. Why did you decide to move back to England? I mean, domestically, the training level compared to other countries is probably not as strong as um, as it could be. So I'm 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 interested to know um, what <laughs> I don't want to say. Like, what were you thinking? But I'm interested to know That's why you don't oh. now. <laughs> well, that's true <laughs> no I think for me you know I've spent 10 years outside of England you know abroad learning learning different things from different different places and um, you know for me I've always you know I've always wanted to to move back home at some point and yeah it kind of felt like it was the right right time um, now um, obviously now, now, you're, now that you're an engaged man yeah <laughs> by the uh, way cheers um, but yeah you know all the English players are now back in England as well um, so we're um, setting up a, we've got a, our own hall at the Nottingham University now so we can use that um, whenever we want and you know we bring in there's a couple of Chinese players there already um, and we can bring sparring over and I thought you know it's um it's a it's, been, it's an opportunity for me to be able to work closer with my with my coach now and you know do the the things that are specific to me that I need to work on um, and right like right now I think you know it's not so much about 
technical stuff anymore. I think, you know, just trying to find the small margins, sort of uh, tactical wise, obviously some, some technical things, uh, mental side of the game, you know, it's all about trying to, trying to find the small game to, to keep making those steps. That seems psychological justification. Uh, <laughs> I also I noticed also that the uh, the Portuguese guys have kind of started moving back towards Portugal as well. So their their focus is a little bit on developing the next generation as well. So was that kind of something that you guys considered when you were moving back to the UK? Um, is that it was a good time for you to try and help, you know, a bit more on the domestic side as well? Yeah, I think um, I think that's what we need in the UK. I think we've sort of, you know, obviously since me and now and Sam and Tom and then Paul before me moved abroad. I think we sort of lost um, a bit of. I, I don't want to say sort. Of, I don't know how to, to put it really, but it was kind of a drop off in level. Um, right. Nobody took the step to move abroad. Um, and it felt always oh, felt a, a little bit comfortable. Um, but I think, you know, us coming back, maybe the younger players, are, <coughs> they can see more how we practice, um, right. how we are, um, you know, inside the ball. And, and I think that, you know, that was definitely helped me when I was younger. Obviously, I was going into all, I can see Paul practicing, working hard, all the other senior players, which I think, you know, the generation under us didn't get to see because we were never in England. Um, so now, hopefully, us coming back can, can be the, the, the next step to help the, the new generation. Cool. Um, the next question is about Marlong, um, because we have to put in one. Um, so, at the time of you playing Marlong, I actually... I think I still owe you a beer from this as well, because I did say if you won, I would buy you a beer. Um, I remember messaging you. You told me you were going to play Marlong. I went to teach some lessons, and I came back. And when you told me that you'd won, I actually had to go to ITTF, because <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't believe you. Um, but I checked it, and you'd won. So what I wanted to know about that match is, I mean, that's a crazy amount of pressure. So how do you keep yourself focused and in the zone when you're in a position to beat, arguably at the time, the best table tennis player in the world? Because, um, I mean, it's easy to, to like drop your focus and lose six points in a row. We've seen him catch up before. Yeah. Um, was there something unique that kind of got you over the line with that match? Um, <laughs> it's difficult to say. I think, you know, at one point, I think I was 2 0 four down or something, and 2 1 10 6. So, you know, for me, I was just, just battling to keep in the game, um, just trying to try do as well as I could. And, you know, there was a few, few moments in the match that I think affected him, um, broke his, his focus and, and stuff like that. And I just kind of capitalized on that. And, uh, Never gave up. I never doubted um, my ability. I just kept playing my game. And at the end of the day, you know, he was just coming back from uh, his injury as well, and uh, maybe wasn't in his best game. But you know, he he was playing at the end of the day, and still got to beat him. And I think you know, sometimes I would maybe try and win the point too early. Whereas in that match, I think, you know, I was playing the rallies with him. I was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and seeing if I could beat him. And um, yeah, a lot, I worked a lot on my mental focus before that and just believing in myself and having more confidence in my game. And, and yeah, it paid off. And, and yeah, just, I, I believe he is the greatest of all time. So um, to say I've beaten him is uh, something I'm really proud of. Um, and then, oh, oh, okay, somebody's asked if I'm taking questions from the live viewers. I'm going to after. I've got 10 questions first, um, which I may have elaborated on. I am. Don't worry. You guys are panicking. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to ask were, were there any kind of pivotal points during your career where you made some kind of addition to your game? Um, whether it be something technical or something physical training or mental 
um, that you felt really stood out as being a platform for your level to increase quite a lot? Yeah, I think the first one uh, was probably sort of around, yeah, just around end, late 2017. Um, obviously, when I was young, obviously, you, it's easier to improve, see more signs of improvement, obviously, when you're younger. Um, but for me, the one that stood out, obviously, end of 2017, um, kind of, um, yeah, leading up to that 2018 season, really, I started working um, with a psychologist and stuff, and we did a lot of work around um, that aspect of the game. And, you know, just making minor adjustments here and there. And, and then suddenly, you know, I started to play really well, had an amazing 2018. Um, and then it kind of, you know, I think it levelled off and um, I needed to find something else. And I think it was sort of late last November, October, November, when Gavin Evans took over as a coach, a uh, person I've known for a long, long time and um, someone I truly believe in um, as my coach now and we worked on a few you know technical tactical things um, that he thought it could help my game uh, take me to the next step and um, you know obviously it takes a while to implement them um, into matches because obviously you're working on them in training sometimes it doesn't necessarily happen straight away but you know I believed in the process and um, I think I've now made another major, major step more recently um, because of that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, the past year for you has kind of been crazy up. So hopefully once all this drama is over, um, you'll be able to keep on going. And yeah. I know you've been doing a lot of stuff at home. I mean, the, the, the thing is now it's difficult to say what's going to happen when everyone comes yeah. out of, of their houses. To, to, I know the Chinese team are are still training basically full time. So they're in Macau at the moment, I think. So I think initially it's going to be a little bit more difficult for anyone to beat them, um, which has kind of played into their hands a little. Um, the last question that I want to ask is um, whether or not you've had a chance to look at the, the model for World Table Tennis next year. Um, I don't know how much detail you've seen about it, but... Um, what your thoughts were about the potential that that has for growing the sport and whether it's something that you're enthusiastic about. Obviously, there's more prize money and the format's changing. Um, yeah, is this, have you have you looked it over or yeah. um, you know, seen much about it? Yeah, and I've spoken a bit with the ITTF about it and um, obviously I've had a you know, gave my thoughts and what I think on the you know, or each of the, the subjects. Um, for me, I think it, you know, if, it, if done correctly, I think it can be a, a very positive step for table tennis um, as a, you know, sort of media-wise and, and getting fans more involved and getting more fans around the world, really. Um, I think it, it can be, obviously, I think that's what it needs, going, you know, tennis direction, that... Um, uh, that way, I think, you know, make it a, a big sport. Um, you know, it's not going to be easy, obviously. Um, but, <laughs> but, yeah, and I think, you know, obviously there's some parts that maybe don't make as much sense, you know, or, or might not make as much sense, you know, how they're going to work some things, you know, like with the ranking and um, who, who qualifies for which tournaments and stuff like that. I think, you know, they're still in the process of, of working that out, but... Yeah, I think, you know, if you've got those big higher tier tournaments that are like, say, your, your Wimbledons and your, you know, your US Open and stuff like that, I think, you know, it, it garners more attention, um, not just in table tennis, but outside and you can sort of sell it better. And I think um, that that is something that table tennis needs. Yeah, I, I thought that, you know, if they went to... If they fixed it to four places, I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know if they're going to have uh, different places for the Grand Smashes each year or whether they want to focus on the same four places each year. Um, but I was kind of hoping they'd do the same four places because you can kind of build everything up um, if you're going back to the same place. So, I mean, if they can go to places that have good quality live streaming and, uh, you know, a good venue and good audiences, um, that would be pretty good. Yeah, definitely. I think you need, you know, they need to start um, 
but I've, I've spoken to him about it, you know, put my point across that I think, you know, the, the, the tournaments need to be in, you know, big cities, capital cities, you know. Yeah. At the moment, you go to some world tours, you're in, you know, you fly somewhere and then you drive another three hours and you're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, though, like, in some tiny hall with nobody watching, I mean, sometimes you're like, why? Like, even, Mal- why? even Malaysia, the world champs in Malaysia was bizarre. I mean, like, yeah. you, your guys' match with Japan was crazy. It was probably the best match of the tournament. And there wasn't really anybody there yeah. um, watching, which was kind of a shame. But then at the same time, it was insane when all of those, um, I guess they were clients of the sponsor yeah. company. Yeah. When they all came to the final, it was a little bit kind of bizarre. And I don't know, it felt a little bit wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I think you know if you take it to big cities, you know, the, people are always going to come in and watch. I think you know, obviously, you're not going to get spectators like you do in in bigger sports, but you know, if you put it yeah. in, in a capital city or a big city and and market it well, you know, there, there's endless possibilities. Okay, well, you've survived my questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, guys, you, you can now throw some questions out for Liam. Um, I'm going to leave you to choose which ones you which ones you answer. So you can kind of go through them, and um, maybe if I see one that really stands out, there you go. That's a good one. One song you listen to before playing a big match. Um. Lose Yourself, Eminem, big tune. I've heard that before. <laughs> I think that's what Lily Jung picked for her uh, big tune. I did it with her before. What a film was that? It was, uh, I think it was a Yola interview I did at, in Budapest last year. And I asked her what her pump up song was. Yeah, I have a yeah. feeling she picked that. There you go, you have something in common. Um, somebody's asked you... Chang Jiko or Ma Long? Uh, who do I think is better? Or? I guess that's the question, yeah. Yeah, I th- yeah. lastly, I think Ma Long's the, the best ever. I think he's, you know, just the sheer way he dominated for like three years straight, like barely lost a match, uh, you know, three years as, as well. Yeah, as I think almost. Yeah, and, you know, he's won everything as well. For me, it's the, the best ever. Yeah. Three worlds. One thing you do to strengthen your mental fortitude in big games? Um, well, it's not just in big games. I think it's just in general, I try to, you know, there's a lot of different techniques um, that I use. Visualization, um, sometimes not my main go to, but, you know, there's other, other things, um, even just before a match just listening to the right music one song that you know you can sort of click with and get in the get in the zone be ready as soon as you step on court hey don't ask that one who's asked that one <laughs> hey as long as he's asking you and not me because yeah, mine's terrible <laughs> um okay Lua wants to know who your training partners are currently or who your training partners will be back in the UK once you start training again? Um, yeah, uh, the England team, basically. Um, and then we have a couple of Chinese players that are at, live in Nottingham at the university um, that are you know, quite a, a decent level. And then, you know, when I'm here, it's about, you know, finding sparring partners that, that will mm-hmm. come up and, and do that. So, um, yeah, like I say, obviously, most of the time I'm away traveling, so so it's uh, it's all about planning when I'm here and, and who I can get along. Uh, let's see what else do we have. Okay, so we're sk- we're definitely skipping the <laughs> we're skipping the card question. You can send him a <laughs> private message and ask him about that afterwards. I, think, I, I don't look at it. I don't look. I'm getting better though. I'm getting better. It's definitely better than mine. Mine's terrible. I got an 11 kill win on Wars only the other day with Walkie. See, that's not bad. He got seven. So that's a big win, that, I tell you. <laughs> uh, okay. 
Oh, good. Th- he's asked two questions. Okay, that's good. So, how much video prep do you do before playing? Um, I do. I watch videos, obviously, you know, the night before, and sometimes in the lead up to a match. Um, for me, I don't like to go into too much tactics and and stuff like that. I prefer to just go out and play my game. But you know, obviously, now my coach, he obviously does more of the analysing the the stuff. Um, feeds back into me you know what he thinks I need to hear and then I, I go from there uh, what made you go to Germany when you were 16 um, I, I you know it was a, an off like um, an opportunity that you know I couldn't really turn down you know a massive massive opportunity to go to you know one of the biggest clubs in Europe um, train with the best players in the world and play alongside them that was uh, that was why I went yeah I mean you kind of have to right I mean the, the even though the UK has training centres and a, an elite you, you, I mean it's the same with players in the US like they you, you have to make yeah. that step it would be interesting to see how far you would have gone if you hadn't gone if you'd stayed in the UK yeah. this whole yeah. time no I, I definitely had to go and I would you know, say to, to young players in the UK now as well, you know, you need to go out there and experience it. Go out there to, to Germany, to France, you know, see how they how they practice and how they do it. Yeah, especially, I mean, it's, it's good that you've played league in so many countries because, I mean, I, I know I went to China and I've played in New Zealand, I've played in the US, which, you know, they're not like particularly strongly reputable countries but i've been to europe as well and you kind of learn something different from watching different countries train like every country has its own little thing that you can kind of pick up on so i guess now that you've traveled to so many countries you must have picked up a lot of stuff from you know from each place that you've gone that's helped your game yeah definitely and now the most recent recent stuff obviously being in japan and learning a lot from them um how they not just how they practice but how they approach the game and and how they you know want to play it's uh yeah it's interesting and it's i think you have to be open-minded and be ready to learn new things and adapt to your game to to the environment mm. what else do we have here um, is there any oh that's a good question is there any advice you would give your 15 year old self um good question um that's a, great, <laughs> that's yeah. a great question i'm just gonna step back here and listen yeah um you know i think obviously looking back there are always things that you you could say I could have done differently. I, I wouldn't say I have any regrets, um, really. Um, but, you know, maybe I could have been more focused in my practice when I was younger, learn, you know, now I know, um, obviously now it's a, it's a little bit different, but now I know, um, sort of difficult to say, like, just to pr- know how to practice, I'd say, better. Yeah. So, you know, not just going into practice and practicing because for the sake of it, really, practicing smarter. Um, I think we you know when I was younger, yeah, I wasn't as as smart with my practice as I am now. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Wise man now, huh? Yeah, I'm like you know, it's all up here. Um, beating Shu Shen or Ma Long, which felt better? I like that question. I think I know the answer. <sighs> Good question again. Um, I think I'd say beating Xu Xin felt better just because I've found him so awkward to play in the past. Um, um, and, you know, it was, yeah, and to do it and feel that. I, I, I don't know. I felt like I was in control of the, you know, after sort of after the first set. I kind of, kind of felt like I controlled all parts of the game, and that definitely gave me a major confidence boost. 
do you think when you get that deep in a world tour event, I mean, winning to win a world tour event for, you know, European players is, is pretty rare. So, I mean, in Qatar, you made the final. But do you think that beating him and the fact that it was a semi final, whereas when you played Ma Wang, it was, was it the first round? Yeah, second round. Those merch, I mean, yeah. going that deep in a, especially Qatar because it's a platinum, um, that must have kind of added to the, yeah, I think the it did. feeling of success. Yeah, I think it did. And, you know, he was into the tournament, you know, semi finals. You know, it's, it's very rare that, you know, the Chinese players lose. And, and to do it at that stage and to play how I did, I just felt, you know, it just felt a lot. I don't know, not a lot better, obviously, but I don't know, it felt different to when I beat Marlon. Mm. Um, there's one, there's an equipment question in there, which was Ryan. Um, how often should a player change blades? That kind of depends on the player, but yeah, maybe how often, how often do you change your equipment now? So, um, I tend not to um, change blade that often. Obviously, you know, it all, all depends... You know, with with the water based glue, obviously blades can um, sort of yeah, it can soak into the blade and make it play a little bit different. So it's all about how you feel, I think, um, with regards to that. Uh, rubbers uh, change quite often. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, if I play a tournament and I'm playing, you know, I know I'm going to play four days in a row, I'll probably change. Depending on how I feel the the rubbers have played and um, how they're looking, uh, either every day or every two days. Yeah, that's how you know. You, that's how you know you've made it to the big time if you're changing your rubber every one or two days. Um, do you know if you're a mini celebrity over in Asia? That's a weird question. Um, Japan's quite quite an interesting place for like. Uh, I guess celebrity status. They're, they're quite into their table tennis players, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the table tennis is big out there, and you know what? From what I've heard, you know, Mizutani and and you know all the, the women and Harry Moto struggle to walk down the street without being noticed. So uh, <laughs> not quite, <laughs> not quite reach that level, but <laughs> well, I mean, you never know. You're, you're you're going into your next season. Give it a few more yeah. seasons. Yeah. If we if we win it, win the league one time maybe. <laughs> what other questions do you guys have? Oh, good. Do you have a practice blade and a match blade? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, usually you have a, a main record and a spare, right? Yeah, I normally um, take or prepare three three rackets for um, a tournament. So, but I tend to just play with one. Um, most of the time, practice and play with the same one. You know, some sometimes they can feel different and and play different. Obviously, you try your best to <laughs> to make them as similar as possible. Um, but yeah, you know, sometimes if I have a bad match with one, I might change. <laughs> Mix it up. <laughs> uh, that's funny because somebody asked about superstitions before. So, do you, do you really do that? You change matches? Are you change rackets? Uh, yeah, I do. Is it is it is it based on the result or is it just on like on how the racket feels? Uh, a bit of both. Um, I don't tend to do that too often, but you know <laughs> I will if um, so. If I'm playing a tournament and I uh, you know play win a match, uh, the next day I've got another match. I'll try and do you know prepare exactly the same way as I did before um, the match that I've won. Um, but other than that, yeah, I try not to to get too stuck or caught up in those uh, superstitions. You don't want to be an equipment jockey. Um, so, Lua Tabletas is asking if you have any standout memories from Rio. Um, you guys made the team, was it the quarterfinal, right? You beat France, which he mentioned. Yeah. You made the team yeah. quarters. Yeah, that was the, the standout moment for me. Um, obviously, last 16 against France um, obviously we just beat them in the quarterfinals of the uh, world championship right, yeah. <laughs> before. Double uh, plus. you know big big revenge match or rematch and um, yeah well, I mean we were I think we were 2-1 down um, I was match point down um, 
so that that would have won them the match. Managed to turn it around, won my match. Sam went on against Gauzy at the end, two two ten seven down, won it twelve ten. Um, it was just a crazy match. I think, it, I think it lasted like over four hours, five hours, and it was just you know getting texts from people. Obviously, it was like three four in the morning in the UK, so people were staying up. It was it was. Uh, it was mad, but yeah, unfortunately we got China in the next match. <laughs> yeah, I mean at the Olympics it's bound to happen. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so somebody's asked if you're playing for Saitama next season. You've already signed for next season, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. When does the season start? Is it the same as? Is it the same cycle as Europe, or a little different? Um. No, I think um, obviously it depends with all the what's going on now. But yeah. as, um, it started at the end of August and finished um, middle of February. Okay, so it's a bit, is it a bit short? It's a shorter season, right? Yeah, so we tend, tend to play matches um, sort of like bunched up. So like we're well, right. you know, in Asia, maybe play th- uh, three or four matches, and then it's a bit of a break, and then you go again two weeks you have four or five matches it's quite a good it's quite a good um, it gives me a bit more time to, to have blocks of practice um, where I can really focus on improving um, someone's asked if you will ever play a USATT tournament I don't know if you play a tournament I've been trying to get him over here I'm working on that <laughs> he didn't offer me he didn't give me a good enough offer I'm not the one making the offer. I'm just passing on different clubs. Uh, no, no, we'll get him, we'll get him here eventually. Yeah, definitely. I, I want to visit. You know, obviously visited New York in the summer. Um, I would like Vegas. to visit more places in the US. So. Like Vegas. Like Vegas. <laughs> sure. Yeah. If there's if, if there's a good prize money for the US Open. And it's in Vegas. I think that might be the yeah. yeah. That might be the single we really might get. <laughs> um, what else do we have here? Word association. Uh, I don't know. No. That could go a little bit badly. <laughs> uh, let's get that one. Gauzy or Calderano? Who is the more creative player? That's tough to answer because we don't know if they're watching or not. They might watch it. Um, I think I mean it, it It depends how you define creativity I think yeah um, yeah I mean Gauzy kind of has like yeah you know shock, shock to, uh, yeah yeah and Calderano obviously it's uh, you know his backhand is um, a bit of a, a bit of a uh, animal you know he rips that that back <laughs> and uh, yeah. especially especially the two hander <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, yeah I mean it's it's difficult to say but um, you know for the you know you know his little strawberry and stuff I think Gals is quite mm. creative in that that area. Do you have a sporting inspiration from other sports? Um, I think my I, I'd say Roger Federer. I just I like how. You know, Good answer. He, yeah, just just how he is, how he you know portrays himself, and you know, obviously when he was young, he was a bit of a hothead, and now he's mm. sort of mellowed and calmed, and um, you know, found a way to channel his emotions, and um, I just think he's a, a great role model for everybody. Really. Are you a cub player? <laughs> what is that? It's like a Swedish game. Yeah, I've, yeah, I can play. I won't say I'm a player, <laughs> but I have played in the past. Someone said you should say Andy Murray. Mm. Okay, moving on. Um, <laughs> favorite recent TV show? I mean, it's a fair question to ask. Now you probably have a lot more time to watch TV than you ever have before. <laughs> yeah. I know I have. I'm just like trying to avoid binging TV every day yeah. um, I mean it's not really that recent but Game of Thrones is my go to favourite TV show Big I haven't even watched one episode of that oh, I'm not going Why if I stop it's not happening <laughs> um, 
okay, let me see. We only have five more minutes left, so let's take a few more. How to improve reverse pendulum serve? Go to YouTube and watch my video. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, I'll tell you, don't watch his video. <laughs> <laughs> what a sellout. Next time, next time, I'll, I'll make him do the demonstration in the video. Yeah. It's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to explain how to improve something technical with words. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you really need to uh, watch as many different videos as you can and take different tips from each one. But yeah, and just you can't really yeah. write stuff or say stuff that's going to help you improve it. No, just give it a go. See what you feel comfortable with. I'd say. How to improve backhand? Yeah, same guy. Is that? Do you have any like? Do you have any like trade secrets for your backhand? Because a few people did ask me before, before um, we started. Difficult for me to sort of explain how I kind of play a backhand. Really, um, he sold his soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I think you know, I tend to use a lot more wrist than um, a lot of players. I uh -huh. think that's where, you know, it becomes deceptive and pl players don't really know where I'm going to play the ball, so it's quite an advantage. Um, but other than that, I mean, I'd say I start, you know, elbow out and, and start how any any other player plays a backhand, but I tend, I think, from a lot of what I've watched and seen, a lot of players tend to have their racket quite closed. Whereas I tend to start with my racket quite open and then f flick my wrist over the ball to get you know more arc and more spin in the ball. So it's not kick at your opponent. Okay, I think we have time for like one more. Um, so let's go with who do you think is the most underrated player? Oh, um, apart from that, I don't know who would you. I don't know if you who you'd class as underrated though. I'd like. Uh, is there anyone that you see that's like kind of outside the top 100 that you feel should be inside? I mean, it's kind of easier. It's easier to pick someone now because there might be someone whose level, their playing level is high, but they don't participate as much. Yeah. Is there anyone that you don't really see so much during tournaments so they have a low ranking, but their playing level is... Um, um, I think, yeah, there's a couple of... Yeah, a young Japanese player that played in, in Saitama a few matches this year, Tagami. I don't you know, he's I think he's making his way up and he's obviously had a lot of he's been improving and actually played quite a few good tournaments recently. I think he's got the ability to to be a very good player from what I've seen of him. Um how I, you know, I've practiced with him and stuff. Um yeah, I quite like now he's made a big step and a big jump, but Dang Chu um, from Germany mm, yeah. started to really, really become a, a solid player. Um, and I think, yeah, he's, you know, maybe not underrated anymore, but, you know, back, you know, say last year, um, before he started to, to really make a step with his wins, I think um, I would say he's, he's up there. Mm. A good answer. Um, okay, well, you've earned your freedom. <laughs> um, I can't, I, we don't have time to ask any more questions because the live stream is going to end. Um, but thanks for putting up with me for an hour. Um, I'm going to I'm going to add another beer to the tab, which is growing every time you pick up a good result. Um, and yeah, I'll see you in Verdansk. <laughs> yeah, see you in the Gulag. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks, guys, for putting your questions in. Obviously, we can't get through everyone's, but um, hopefully you've found some of these answers interesting. Um, I think you did a pretty good job of answering them. Um, and I'll see who else I can pick up for some more interviews. Um, and I'll post this whole video to my IGTV and I'll throw it on Facebook as well. But mm -hmm. thanks, chum. <laughs> That's it, geese. All right. Yeah. See you later. Thanks, guys. <laughs>